Howdy, everybody. Welcome to another edition of The Bituation Room podcast. I am your host, Francesca Fiorentini. Super glad to have you here as we count down the episodes before I take a little pause, a little breathy breathe to, you know, um, bring new life into this perfect world. It's perfect, right? Shh, say nothing. Say nothing of what we've done. Protect her virgin ears. Um, thank you for being here. Thank you for pressing play. Of course, if you are listening as a podcast in the future, you know everything is fine. It's all been wrapped up. By the time you're listening to this, socialism. It's come to America. Um, and while you're there, give this podcast five stars on iTunes. Helps people discover it. And if you're here on Twitch or YouTube, what up? Make sure you're liking all the things, pushing all the bells, uh, blowing all the whistles, clicking all the clacks, you know, whatever you do on all the various platforms. We have a great show today. We're, we are going to be breaking down what's going on in Iran, how women once again kick an ass. And with us is a kick ass uh, Iranian American comedian, Zara Norbash, who is here. She's been on the show before. It's been too long. So I'm excited to have her on to go over that as well as are the walls finally closing in around Donald Trump? Yes. Will there be consequences? No. Okay, next. But no, let's talk about it. Um, we uh, are on the precipice of another January 6th hearing. Again, one of the many ways we could potentially lock him up. Um, but will we? So, yeah. And joining me also is going to be Eli Day, a journalist who uh, writes for all kinds of awesome alternative lefty publications. And specifically, I want to know about his work reporting from Georgia and what is going on on the ground. How are voters feeling? Are we still on the high of having turned a red state blue in 2020? Um, just to kind of piggyback on some of the conversations we've already been having on this show. Um you know, with Black Voters Matter um, and then Latasha Brown and then uh, Tom uh, Bonnier from last week. So, yeah, excited to get into all that. And then, of course, because we're just going to do all the faves, we're going to have an edition of the Thatchers because women mm, crushing it and being awful this week. So uh, stay tuned for that. And as always, patrons, which get access to special bonus content at patreon.com slash bituation room. We're talking 10, 15, 20, 30, usually no more than 30 minutes of bonus content. Every single episode, a bonus story. This week, Cuba voted to legalize same-sex marriage. Pretty big stuff. Um, and we're going to talk about it. How much does it mean? What does it mean for democracy coming to the island? Um, NATO Green is not here for that, but, um, you know, you can, like, add him later if you want to know his thoughts, because um, I'm sure he has a lot of them as he uh, clinks a, uh, I don't know, a piece of ice in his rum and will want to wax all gringo about Cuba. But anyway... Um, let's get into the week. Let's get into everything that's been going on um, with, of course, the best way to start off an episode, which is what are you bitching about? Um, 
okay, so this is not something I'm mad at. This is something I'm excited about uh, because we've discussed, you know, I've got a soft spot for Latin American politics. We um, had Daniel Pardo on to break down the election of Colombia's first leftist president uh, a few weeks ago or a few months ago at this point, um, Gustavo Petro, and um, and talked about his environmental policies and the hopes that he's trying to change Colombia's extractive fossil fuel based economy transition it essentially right uh and and you know we we also spoke about debt and the ways that you know us uh, and and other international debt straps second world or global south countries into that sort of like endless cycle of carbon emissions and extraction etc cetera, etc cetera, et cetera, at the detriment of the amazon at the detriment of rainforests at the detriment of their own well-being of rural and indigenous communities and Rarely do you hear some of that like just really incredible fire um, being spit on the world stage uh, out of the mouth of someone like a new leftist president like Gustavo Petro, who spoke at the UN General Assembly this week and basically called out, I would imagine mostly like first world nations, you know, the West, uh, the so-called heavy quotations, democratic nations. Um, basically on the way that they utilize the global South as their dumping ground, all while they don't actually change policies, like, for example, drug policies, um, to actually mitigate violence, to actually help people. Um, and here's what he had to say, and I will, I will translate as I play. Para excusar los vacíos y las soledades... So he says, we serve you only to fill the emptiness. Hang on, let me start this again because uh, I need it. We serve you to only fill the emptiness and loneliness of your society. Which you are leading to live in the midst of drug bubbles. Drug bubbles, dude. We hide from your problems. You, we hide you from your problems. This, this was easier in theory and less easy as I'm actually trying to do it. Hang on. Burbujas de las, el medio de las burbujas de las drogas. Les ocultamos sus We hide from you your problems that you refuse to reform. Mejor es declararle la It's better to declare la war on the jungle, on its plants, on its people. While you let the forest burn, while being hypocrites chase the plants. Las con with poisons to hide the disasters of your own societies. Nos piden más y más you ask us for more and more coal, more and more oil, to calm your other addiction, that of consumption consumo, of money, of power. La poder, la del no es la selva It's la not culpable. the rainforest that's to blame. The, the culprit is your society educated in endless en consumption. Sin fin, en la in the stupid confusion between consumption and happiness that allows the pockets of power to fill with money. Bruh. Oh my God. Like, shit, dude. This is like, he's having his little Greta Thunberg moment or his big moment. This is president just recently assumed in August of Colombia, Gustavo Petro, to the General Assembly. Now, yeah, it wasn't the longest speech. Um, I think the uh, the leader of Iran had the longest speech, which makes sense because the guy's got a lot to distract from at this point. Um, but it was searing and important and just like, you guys just ask us for more and more and more coal and oil to feed your c consumptive addictions. It's kind of the like staring into the soul moment. He's just sort of grasping the... You know, I don't know who was at lunch. I don't know who was there. I don't know if people actually listened or paid attention or when they're listening in their little like translator boxes and they're like, mm-hmm. Oh, he's talking about capitalism. Ugh, next. But that's effectively what he's doing. And I think, especially for a country that is, I would say, as strategic of a partner um, to the United States as Colombia in its efforts around the failed drug war, 
in its efforts around, you know, um, free trade agreements and all that, in the ways that is consistently leaned on the leaders of Colombia to get their, whether it's trade unionists fighting Coca-Cola back in the 90s, to indigenous people, to, you know, uh, uh, rural folks, to anyone to just pipe down so that we can continue to make money off of your country and your natural resources. And here you have Gustavo Petro, whether or not he's going to be able to deliver on this. And we talked, you guys should all look back and listen back to the, uh, the Daniel Pardo interview um, where we discussed what Gustavo Petro will and will not be able to do. But I think that is just, it's just such a, it's like when you hear sometimes Bernie, you know, sometimes Bernie got it. Sometimes he doesn't, you know what I'm saying? Depending on the day, he's feeling off, he's feeling good. But it's like that that Bernie energy. We're like, bruh, someone's saying the truth. And it feels very important. And so I'm not bitching about anything. I'm lifting up leaders in Latin America like that. And I hope there can be more of that. I know, you know, you've got Gabriel Boric in, in Chile, um, very much aligned with that. And uh, we shall see what is to come, especially upcoming elections in Brazil. Um, anywho, that is my little contribution to this segment. And joining me is the co-host of the award-winning podcast, Good Muslim, Bad Muslim. She's a resident senior fellow with the Pop Culture Collaborative on comedy. And she's also just a wonderful comedian and person. Please welcome Zara Nurbash. Hey! I what am up? also now full time at the podcast Snap Judgment. Oh my God, that's amazing! Yeah, what up? Send me your stories, folks. <laughs> but do you have like, do you have the beat that Glenn Washington has? Like, no one, no one does. No one has that. Hey, snappers, are you gonna have your little? You know, I like Snap Judgment. I I love Snap Judgment actually. I mean, who doesn't? It's phenomenal. Snap Judgment has some of the best fucking stories. Cinematic audio, folks. Get on board. <laughs> yeah, don't tell Glenn this, but sometimes I'm like, I don't need a beat right now. I'm just going to be honest with you. Sometimes I don't need a beat. You don't Occasionally need a beat. I don't. And if you guys don't listen to Snap Judgment, you should now because Zara's working on it. Hell yeah. Um, that's great. Zara, what? It's been a while since you've been on. Um, what are you bitching about today? In this time that I have been away, uh, I have been bitching about my Honda CRV's um, navigation interface. <laughs> okay, this is very can we, specific. Can we talk and I about this? It. This yes. is very important. Okay, listen, folks. I understand that with 2008, everything collapsed. And in addition to that, George Bush did away with like a bunch of deregulation, okay? And I know we're all like down with a man and anti-fascist and I'm with that. I am so anti-fascist, except for when it comes to one thing I wanna unilaterally be in charge of. You wanna be a Nazi that, on this one thing, okay? <laughs> I don't wanna be a Nazi on anything. You, you said fascist, I mean, I'm just. They, they don't own fascism, come on. Okay, okay, but, but let me let me hear you out. Let me hear you out. Let's see what you okay, want. Okay, okay. I, I want to emulate the Iranian government on the following singular problem. <laughs> okay, my Honda CRV has this function where when you're trying to plug in your phone to get your stupid map, it sends you this like teeny tiny little text that asks you questions in the middle of the road. Like oh, God. questions. That you have to like select while you're going like 80 miles an hour. I'm always going 75. And you're like, did I miss my turn? I don't know. Where am I? I'm in the middle of the woods. I have no idea. <laughs> I might need and it's gas. usually and like, it's usually like, are you parked and me and like, yeah. <laughs> can you pay attention right now? Because I wouldn't want to like go forward unless you were practicing all the safety precautions. You're like, motherfucker, me trying to read this is preventing me from being safe. Um, you understand. It is, it's like a you it's like a understand. sign on the road about buzz driving. Like buzz driving is drunk driving, but one that's like a little bit too incendiary. One that's like, it's did like you know that, that like? Sign, yeah, it's like if that sign was bouncing, 
Right. <laughs> he oh, was around. bouncing and there was just like, but like on, like written on a girl's boobies. And it was <laughs> like, you know, did you know that like seven Tecates is like the equivalent of like four Coronas? And anyway, you probably shouldn't drive buzz. Yeah. And by that time you're already in an accident. On top of that, it's asking you to select which one. Seven Tecates? <laughs> yeah. Please My select phone me. My Prius takes care of me. Um, I don't know if I take care of it, but uh, it, it doesn't even let me, like, if I'm on the five and it's already like an 85 mile an hour, 90 mile wrap, uh, hour, like, wrap for me and I'm just going, I'll plug in my phone and it's like, sorry, you can't, you've got to be stopped. I'm like, <laughs> fuck, fuck. Which also <laughs> is so messed up because how many of us are using our Google Maps or ways to figure out where we're going and then it's just like, Sorry, you need to hit the brakes in the middle of the highway in order to, for you to see where you are. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Who came Slow up with on this? this dirt road? That's so funny. So, so you have to do like I it's like three Honda. different screens. And what do they say? They they told me that I can write a complaint. And I wrote the complaint and then they gave me a phone number and I called their phone number and I said I want to speak with the head of your governance for your corporation. The, I, I'm sorry, man. Who the who the who the head of governance? Yes. Me, I can get you to my manager, um, but I'm calling you from a call center in <laughs> Pakistan. So <laughs> please connect me. Give me to your the manager. head of your governance. Beep boop pop. <laughs> I better I hear mean, beep boop pops. So so did you get on the phone with somebody to complain? I'm waiting. Did you actually Okay, you're going to get a call back. I'm following through. I wrote to them and I said, I want to be a part of solutions. I don't just want to be a drop in the bucket of your complaints. This, I feel like this is all a setup for your like your first episode of Snap Judgment, where you're like, come to CRVs. <laughs> Let me tell you. Hello, snappers. <laughs> I'm sorry. What happened? That's usually what? what I'm listening to when I'm on the road is just Snap Judgment. But anywho, okay, I digress. And then it I cuts that's off. And then your Prius is like, you need to be stopped. I'm yep. sorry. Yep. That's exactly right. Um, Zara, uh, this is a good thing a bit bitch about the year. There's too many screens. I mean, I feel like, yeah, okay, admission. My mom has a Tesla. <sighs> and uh, I know you think, is wow, it that's really, it's really bougie. It is. It's also really dangerous because we're talking about someone who asks me for tech support on their iPad, about their iPad, like once a week. All right. <laughs> oh, no. Who falls for phishing scandals every other day. I've been over this. <laughs> now, what if you take that 75 year old woman and you put her inside of an iPad, like on wheels that goes a hundred miles, oh, like no. whatever, like that, that is what we're doing when elderly people buy Teslas and it's not okay. <laughs> and I'm, I'm admitting a lot to you guys right now, but I'm just, I'm very worried. No, um, it's not okay. And I'll tell you what, I'm going to draw another connection here. Okay. Yes. There is an addiction on the part of apps. All right. They want our input all of the time. I can't tell you how many times I have had to look away when Waze and Google and all these other apps that like want me to interact with them while I'm on the road are like, is this still here? <laughs> how are we doing? Do Can you, you give us five like stars? It? By the way, if you're listening to this podcast, please pull over. I mean, we're like literally <laughs> grind to a halt and then give you the show five stopped. stars. You need please to be stopped. stopped. All right, well, let's get into everything that's happened this week. A few stories we will not dive into, but off the top, um, Italy is poised to have its first fascist leader in the country since Benito Mussolini 80 years ago, and she is a she. And yet somehow all the Nazi nerds who hated on Captain America, the She-Hulk, and the female Ghostbusters, and blah, 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 suddenly they're silent now. Just when wow. fascism has gone woke the actual fascists are saying nothing, all right? It's see, literally their turf, and they've got nothing to say. Don't, isn't, aren't I mean, you mad about inclusivity now? That's anti-fascist. <laughs> exactly. You are anti-fascist by default. Yeah. <laughs> if they always have something to say, come on. Not now. Now they're celebrating wokeism in the fascist movement. I don't know. I smell a rat. 
Um, Russia's war in Ukraine, <laughs> not going well, as evidenced by millions fleeing the country and people attacking military offices over the recent instatement of the draft. Thankfully, Putin is in a sensory deprivation pod in one of his mansions, and he's feeling really good about the not war right now. So please do not kill his vibe or he will kill us all. So this is the only reason why they're talking about reform in Iran. If y'all want to talk conspiracies while Russia's busy, let's change it. Ooh, I like this. Let's ho hold on to that thought. You're like, Russia's <laughs> occupied. We can, we can, let's do some shit. Um, NASA managed to hit an asteroid with a DART satellite. I believe it's a satellite or a vehicle. I bet called... you they have the same app as Honda. They I definitely do. <laughs> <laughs> as they're zooming in they're like no no yes yes damn it god no fuck um five it's stars. Stars the, yeah okay five stars for the bituation room uh the double <laughs> asteroid redirection test is what it's called and it, it basically tried to hit this asteroid to scoot it off its trajectory it was a test mission that could help prevent an asteroid from colliding with earth and what astronomers are calling planetary defense and what astrologers oh are calling resisting the universe's designs for your Libra season. And right in the middle of Mercury <laughs> being in retrograde, this is just, just not a good look, NASA. All right? Consult your crystals. Consult your fucking... Oh, you want to talk God. about rocks? Consult yours. I would watch the shit out of... Uh, what was that movie with Bruce Willis? Oh, Armageddon? <laughs> yeah, I would watch Armageddon 2, Libra season. Yeah, Armageddon, <laughs> but they're just trying to, like, change the stars. They're trying to make Mercury not in retrograde so they can, like, go out to brunch without any problems. Um, <laughs> One day! I want to see a NASA scientist and, like, an astrologer just kind of go at it, you know, and see, like, <laughs> where we agree and where we don't agree. Because I feel like this yeah, is very much... How do we if an asteroid is meant to hit the camera. Earth... Who are we to change the universe's plans? I mean, I'm not one of those folks. I told my husband, I don't care if I'm a piece of brain with a piece of eye in a vial around your neck. Keep me alive. <laughs> Wait a minute. I really See like, it through. I really like a little Zara vial and brain just like, right you, you put the toilet paper on wrong. Like, that's what I would do if I were like <laughs> left. To, I'd be like. I'd be like, are you going to eat all of that? <laughs> you know, Clean your the plate. The worst part of my brain. Um, <laughs> yes. Oh, God. And finally, uh, this week we'll have the next and possibly final installment of the January 6th hearing. We'll see. It seems like a hurricane has also disrupted the January 6th hearings, which is just mwah, so fitting. Um, it the may feature... hearing. I know. It, 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 but this one is going to be juicy, okay? It's going to have Roger Stone apparently calling for violence and p potentially text messages from the phones of Secret Service agents on that day. The question is still, will there be consequences for Trump? Find out next time when the coup succeeds. For everything else, this is the yeah. week where. Okay, so this is the week where protests continued in Iran over the murder of Masa Amini, a 22-year-old Kurdish woman who was visiting Tehran and died in police custody after being arrested for not properly wearing a hijab, according to them. Um, protests have raged in 46 cities, um, very much so in Kurdistan. Um, Kurds make up 10% of the uh, Iranian population, and over 75 have been killed and 1,400 arrested. And we say, like, I mean, a lot of the people who've been killed are young, other young women, right? Other young women who are, you know, cutting their hair off in solidarity, wear, not wearing the hijab, walking up to police um, defiantly and being just open fired upon. I just want to play a little, little clip. It's not violent, but it is a uh, protest to give you a taste of what folks have been up to.
So these are a lot of young people, a lot of women, um, women wearing hijab, not wearing hijab, burning them, not like just still wearing them doesn't matter. But it, but you know, and chants are ranging from justice for Masamini to down with dictatorship to straight up. This is about the Islamic Republic and the draconian laws, not just. The, from the morality police, which is uh, the body that arrested Masa, but just in general. Um, and I wanted to just, Zara, your reactions, your thoughts, I don't know if you you have family in Iran still, but just kind of like off the top, what are you feeling? So much emotion. My whole family is in Iran. Salam. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> We communicate on social media because I can never see them in person unless it's in a different country. Um, I'm not allowed and to why go. Is that? Uh -huh. uh, I wrote and published um, work about sex and about coming out as queer. And that makes me uh, incapable of going. It just it makes it so risky. Uh, yeah. depending on where the country's politics are at, how they're deciding to rain down on activists. Um, folks before me, like Jason Rezaian, Shane Bauer, you know, um, showed me it's not really safe. There's a clamp down too that happens. Um, and you know, yo, for <laughs> all the folks out there questioning, should I have a pen name? Should I not get a pen name? Right. Uh, I didn't, I didn't realize until after my, uh, articles came out about me that went viral, um, that so many, uh, Iranians, public facing Iranians use pen name last names so mm. that they're not Googleable when they go to customs because um, you have to protect your SEO so that you're not a, a known uh, entity when you go there and you can just go visit your grandma. Right. Um, and sure. it's so have it's you been communicating been lately and like, what is it? How does it feel to see so many young women out there? on the streets. Yeah. I mean, it's such a mix of emotions, right? It's exciting. It's also really scary because I'm worried about them. They are dying. Um, they are dying at the hands of a government that does not care about human life, that doesn't care about their life, but also like just doesn't unilaterally doesn't care about human life. Right. Um, because yeah. they're murdering women over a piece of clothing, um, uh, mm -hmm. that they're, that they're unilaterally deciding on behalf of everybody in Iran, that that means that they're not only um, anti-government, anti-Iranian, uh, but also and they're deciding for them that it's anti-Islamic. The, the the women have no choice in this, yes. um, and that's that's not Islam. These mm. these are the actions that they're committing are anti-Islamic. The actions that the Iranian government is committing right now are anti-Islamic, um, and statements like that. Um, that you just said, Francesca, that I didn't say, uh, make it hard <laughs> for people to boldly speak on other foreign country soil. You know, it, it makes it scary for me. I wonder like, what do you mean when down with the dictatorship to... or just, just like anything criticizing them? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Any amount of criticism. I mean, the, like, and these are trademarks of fascistic governments, right? Is that mm. like, any any amount of like any kind of statement that you make, however, um, you know, small it seems um, and however part of a conversation it seems to be have devastating consequences. Yeah. And I think it's so funny, you know, we're in this country, um, you know, first of all, the parallels between bodily autonomy and sovereignty, I think, need to be drawn and any any woman in this country standing on a high horse and saying, well, at least we're not like that. No, in a lot of states, we're headed that way um, as our um, rights are, are being completely taken away and we're being left, yeah, to die. I mean, through sort of obstetric, you know, medical nightmares, but it's, it is a slippery slope, but at the same time, Again, yeah. Um, yeah, but, but I'm saying like, it's, uh, it's also funny that you have for the right is just like, you know, we don't have freedom of speech. You can't say anything anymore. And you're like, 
no, these are, this is a country where you can't say anything anymore. And in fact, countries that you cozy up to and love, you know, whether it's Hungary, right? Or it's like, Putin's actually not that bad. You know, he, you know we saw also this week clampdowns on protesters in, in Moscow and other cities across Russia, you know, around their escalation of war. But let's get into what's going on. So yes, even though Masamini was Kurdish. It's bigger than that. So this is um, from The Guardian saying, um, there's no doubting the Kurdish revolutionary fervor that Masamini's death has sparked among Iran's long oppressed Kurdish population, said Ranj Aladdin, senior fellow at the Middle East Council on Global Affairs. But her brutal death has come to symbolize something much bigger than the Kurdish cause in Iran that strikes at the very heart of the political and ideological system that underpins the Islamic Republic. Um, and this yeah. is from... Yeah, and then this is just from a random woman, didn't want to be identified. She said, it's happening in ways that have ne we've never been, that have never been known before. Even if we don't win, we've already won in many ways. The state cannot ignore us now. Our stance has made them weaker. So, okay. Yeah. And thank you to uh, the, another woman in Tehran who refused <laughs> to be identified. That, that shit is fucked up. And please news outlets that just like keep you know playing video of the protest pixelate people's faces mm -hmm. especially when people are gathering social media of other people you d you don't know how that facial recognition software is being utilized totally yeah no that's so 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 scary and and i did want to mention you 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 touched on the hijab as you know like who determined this is the you know the end all be all of of being a Muslim or being, you know, of, of Islamic faith. Or I mean, actually, that's, you said more about like the, the way the state's behaving. But I do think it's really interesting learning about the history of Iran and its ties to how much and whether we and what we ascribe the hijab, um, what kind of meaning we has, ascribe to the hijab. Because just quickly and then I'll kick it to you. But we all must remember that the United States helped overthrow um, Mossadegh in the year 1951, is Iranian uh, president at the time, um, who wanted to nationalize the oil. And of course, the United States could have none of that. Um, we, no, we wanted our oil deals. We didn't want Iran to nationalize their oil. And he was kind of an, uh, a, like a middle, um, sorry, an Arab nationalist, right? Um, so not only um, sovereignty for Iran, but also um, pan-Arab solidarity with other countries. That also was a threat to the United States' um, economic and political interests. So they helped topple him, install the Shah. And under the Shah, um, the hijab was banned pretty much. It was seen as a symbol of backwards uh, ideology. No, you know, yes, we're Muslim, but no hijab. You know, we, we need to be so-called Western etc. Until 1979, when you have the Iranian Revolution, which then instills and installs and, and under which the current, you know, Iran is currently under the idea that no, 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 the hijab is a symbol of Iranian nationalism, Muslim identity, religion, and it ha and it must be worn. So here you have women being used as pawns back and forth, back and forth, based on whether they choose to wear a scarf or not. Um, and so it's a long history that is always centered other people making decisions for Iranian women and not women making decisions for themselves. And that, yeah. 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 So much, well, so much to unpack there. Let, uh, I, first I, I want to say, um, hijab is a concept, you know, um, not one piece of clothing. Um, mm. and in, in my, um, in in my work uh, and in my comedy, I've been sort of trying to um, do what I can to m specifically state the headscarf as separate from hijab. Mm, okay. um, hijab hi hijab is a religious concept of modesty, um, and that our notions of modesty and humility are faith based. Um, and you know, my pops always said, uh, "Nobody gets between you and Allah." It's a personal decision, you know, how you interpret that and how you choose to express that. Um, these are my opinions. My opinions are facts on this. Uh, yeah. and, <laughs> and hijab hijab is really different from like articles of clothing mandated 
by a government to the point that they will to the point that they will kill you if you don't follow suit uh, in that uniform is how I look at it. Um, And, you know, so I really encourage people when we're talking about hijab to identify the difference between um, what a government has decided to theocratically mandate as an expression of um, first uh, a- approval of the government, mm-hmm. appro- you know, a- um, working, you know, uh, in accordance with the mandates of the state. Uh, and then God, they have, a- they have actively put themselves between uh, the Muslim people and God. Yes. They've just de- decided. I mean, it's the same way in the United States, right? We, the, you know, Christian nationalists say this is how you should worship um, a right. Christian God even. I mean, shit, forget about other religions and, you know, the fact that we have religious freedom in this country. Um, but there is only one way. You know, you saw there is a video of a guy saying uh, proposing um a dad who was like, hey, let's put up in God we trust, but in uh, Arabic in this school. And they were like, nah, as if there aren't Christian Arabs, <laughs> you know, like as if, you know, there is only one way to worship their God. But but I think that's a really great point that like and this is the thing is like you are instilling um, meaning to someone's like personal faith and, and their own relationship with their God um, and, and I, having I that having the state do that. Right. Having the state do that is really fucked up. So it's I don't know. Yeah. And thank you for 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 that, like drawing that difference. And I and I think it's important to say that, like in different times in Iranian history, wearing a headscarf has been seen as an act of resistance and protest versus not. So, again, when it was required, like now, if it's required, then wearing it a little bit looser might be seen and clearly was seen as an like an act of defiance over which an innocent woman was murdered Uh, and women are, and people are continue to be murdered. Well, and and women can, women continue to be murdered, you know, um, as symbols of the state's power. We see that in the United States. We're seeing that across the world and we're witnessing that in Iran right now. And I think there's a reason why globally we're feeling that globally we're kind of over oppression. We're over it. Yeah. Yeah. We're just done. And I just want to, you know, quickly, point out that um it's not just me saying it um but in 2017 this is this is other moments in Iranian history where the headscarf has sort of been a symbol Vida Movahed climbed on a f- platform in Engel Lab Rev- or Revolution Street in the center of Tehran took off her headscarf and waved it in the air as a sign of opposition to compulsory hijab she was followed by other women and the movement quickly became known as the girls of Revolution Street um, and that women have been leading in also the t- 2009 Green Revolution, if you guys remember that, women have been at the forefront of a lot of resistance movements in Iran and calls for reform, calls for real democracy. Um, and then finally, um, you know, the most recent president, Ibrahim Raisi, when he became assumed office in 2020, the message was clear women would be further oppressed. Um, And women have been in the lead of all these protests, posing a real challenge to the regime. They're leaders of transformative change, the vanguard of potential revolution, challenging the legitimacy of the current government. That is from an article reposted on comment, I mean, uh, on uh, informed comment. Um, A man, Juan Cole, love him. But uh, any any final thoughts, Zara? Oh man, Uh, so many. Um, Listen to the Iranian people, listen to uh, what it is that they're asking for. Be wary of liberal racism and colonization that calls for, um, you know, uh, an upheaval and war. War is not the answer. Uh, And what the Iranian people are living through, um, they are the ones to speak to what is uh, right for them. Right. Absolutely. And I think that there, we can do both. Like we can report on this and talk about it without being heavy handed or like, you know, sort of, again, colonial about it and being like, well, I think this is what needs to happen. And so threading that needle is important and, um, and yeah, imagine that. Right. Reporting where we're curious and we ask questions and we (laughs) We let people speak for themselves. 
<laughs> oh God, we don't want to immediately go to war. I mean, and this is the the last thing I'm going to say is, you know, this is at a time when the Iran deal is like on the fritz pretty much. I mean, Biden, you know, is supposed to be reviving it, but extremists in the United States and extremists in Iran, they, yes. I mean, on in the political right, they hate the Iran deal. And so, and it seems like Raisi is part of the more, you know, the far right in Iran. And you've got, the point is, is like, don't get it twisted. It's not us versus them. Yes. It's the far right in each of our countries versus the grassroots, the people. Uh, and so we need to make sure we humanize um, folks there just as we don't want to be defined by fucking Lauren Boebert or whomever. Yes, the, the sanctions that we place on Iran here are in part responsible for the strain on Iranians there. Yes, yes, also that, which is like, come on. Like, I mean, I think that there's, and again, this is like looking at Russia, you're like, where, what can Biden do? What more can he do, you know? Um, Listen, and while Russia's busy, while, <laughs> while Russia was busy, occupied, let's get some shit done. <laughs> right, because yeah, Iran can't really lean on Russia too much. They're stretched thin. I mean, there are some folks that say uh, Russia has quite a hold on Iran. I don't know enough about the nuances of foreign policy to be able to comment on that, uh, except for per pure entertainment. <laughs> Except it'd be fun to imagine. Um, right. No, all right. Well, let's let's move on um, briefly. The question is: Are the walls closing in on Trump? Finally, uh, this week, Ugh. New York Attorney General Tish James announced a civil lawsuit against Donald Trump and his kids. Uh, we can look into that uh, because he they obviously as an as a practice overinflated all of their assets. Um, Trump allegedly said his Trump Tower apartment was 30,000 square feet. <laughs> when in fact, it's only like almost <laughs> 11,000 square feet. Like, OK, the fuck? this is and then this is obviously in New York. <laughs> And then used the lie to get his apartment valued at $327 million in 2015, a time when only one apartment in New York had ever sold for as much as $100 million. He massively overvalued his golf clubs, in some cases adding 30% to the valuation based on his estimate estimation of the Trump brand, which I love that. Like, well, if you consider how important the brand is, like, bitch, how much is that brand <laughs> worth now? Uh, and he claimed as personal cash assets were actually held by partnerships, he had no distribution rights over. OK, so I don't have that much cash because other people own the cash. I it's like very like they keep me on a tight leash. Um, so these are some of the reasons why um, this is, is is a civil case and this lawsuit is moving forward. Um, and now the other thing that's happening um, in terms of what could mm. happen to him. So I know if people are like, especially me, I'm like, who like financial shit? Like these, yeah, these right. guys are slimy as hell. They're, they'll get out of it. They'll just make their, they'll, I mean, they'll make their base pay for their own legal expenses. Yes. And, and whatever they don't get away with, they'll make their own tax deduction. Exactly. It'll Absolutely. Be, it'll, it'll be like Nestle bottling your water that's free to you, charging you $2 and then asking for a government subsidy. <laughs> uh, yes, they will find some way to make the people pay yeah. for it. But if there are consequences, um, this is what they will be. Um, Tish James asking for the court to order Trump and his organization to disgorge an estimated $250 million in fraudulent profits. She wants Trump and his co-conspirator children, again, all, Eric Trump, Don Jr. and Ivanka, Baron mm. and Tiff got off. Um, they, uh, she wants Trump and his co-conspirator children to be banned from running a business in New York, banned from conducting real estate transactions in New York for a period of five years. And perhaps most importantly, she wants Trump and his organization to be banned from applying for loans from any financial institution registered in New York for five years, which I'm like, hmm. you, that's, that's Wall Street. That's all the banks. I don't know. I mean, at Deutsche Bank, did that connection dry up? Like what sort of, is there a credit union in South Carolina that wants to loan Trump 50 mil? Like, is there, is there that, that credit union like, is named Putin. 
<laughs> no, th- that is that's exactly this is my right. credit like, card. Th- um, but again, we've discussed this a little stretch thin. Mm. I mean, if he ever, if you know, if Putin wants to liquidate one of the mansions, um, maybe but get the footage I have, right. I have no doubt that if Trump loses again, mm. uh. Like, they're all going to wind up in Russia. Like, I, I just, they, you know, look, this is you think not... think so? I think at some point, it just makes sense. Huh? It's either that, was, that or mean, on Peter Thiel's floating, like, tax haven barge. If that ever gets it, off the ground or water. Yeah, is he basically, at this point, are all those fools, like, that island of plastic water bottles, that island of plastic trash the great, just floating yeah, the in great the ocean? Pacific. The Great Pacific right, Garbage Patch. That's <laughs> like I'm sorry to send this year away, but we just we've had it a while. We push them out yeah. to sea. That's what I wish we could do with white collar criminals, just and just push you out to sea. You you'll be fine. Um. So okay. So that's one of the ways that the walls are closing in. Um. There is mm-hmm. she has referred the case for criminal um for criminal prosecution in the Southern District of New York. Um, and the current U.S. attorney for the Southern District is Damian Williams, appointed by Biden, mm. confirmed to the Senate last October. Um, he's a former law clerk of Merrick Garland, so we will see. I still think people are a little too shook to actually charge him with a crime and especially financial shit. So we'll see. But the other thing, you know, we've got the documents uh, crimes, many crimes related to those stolen slash taken slash borrowed documents. Crimes many multiple crimes and this was trump uh y'all might have seen this but we have to play it because it's just so good trump goes on sean hannity hannity's clearly trying to help him clear his name on these documents and here's what trump genius man just 70 chess player has to say about those documents and their classification because the president of the united states you unlike say hillary clinton in her case right a president has the power to declassify. Correct. Okay. You had said on Truth Social a number of times you did de- declassify. I did declassify, yeah. Okay. W- is there a process? What was your process to declassify? There doesn't have to be a process, as no. I understand it. it. You know, there's different people say different right. things, but as I understand, there doesn't have to be. If you're the president of the United States, you can declassify just by saying um, it's declassified, even by thinking about it, because you're sending it to Mar-a-Lago or to wherever you're sending it. and there doesn't have to be a process. There can be a process, but there doesn't have to be. You're the president. You make that decision. So when you send it, it's declassified. We, I declassified everything. <laughs> <laughs> everything. Everything. Um, you think it, you think it, and it's oof. declassified. I love that. It, it again, though, it is so Trumpian. I mean, obviously, because it's, idiotic and fascistic and just like the most strongman bullshit because i did it it's legal um (laughs) but it it is like the secret i mean i believe that trump operates on the like you know if you can believe it you can achieve it you know what i mean it's like again he's (laughs) he's secreting his way around u.s law and you're like that's not how it works bro but my god the white privilege involved in you being able to get away what? with this much so far. Like, and, uh, and I'm okay. Here's what I will say. I'm just waiting for him to like, yeah. I've, I just finished the last season of stranger things. So I want him to, when he declassifies, <laughs> I want like a little blood drop coming out of his nose. <laughs> as he's like, I mean, no disrespect to L, but I do think that'd be very funny. I declassified them all. <laughs> I need this meme. I need, I need, I need the meme. I know. Sorry, Zara. You, what, thoughts on how can he get I away just, just with saying something so dumb? Well, I, I mean, I think we can all count on Twitter to get him. <laughs> <laughs> Twitter's a process, and he thinks Twitter is not going to get him. But you know what? We're watching, and he's done for. 
will be watching. You're getting ratioed <laughs> like crazy, bro. I don't know what's happening on Truth <laughs> Social, but on Twitter, we're owning your ass. It's bad news. Um, yeah, we're owning The lulls <laughs> are coming. It's just, yeah. I mean, but he's like, if you think it, you can think it, you know, it's just like, like, I, I, I is there if you any... want to put it on a lunchbox or like a fucking like box of cereal? If you believe it, you can achieve it. If you think it, you can declassify it. Like it's just oh. like how many different ways can a dude be on the news loud and proud talking about how he wants to be the US dictator and that he's gonna misuse operations of government and protocol to achieve that and that he sees himself above that? Like, yeah, is there anything? No, I mean, is he wrong? Is he wrong? Because he's still doing. Is he wrong? I don't know. I'm if he's convinced wrong. Trump is an op for critical race theory. You know what I mean? Like <laughs> Trump was put into our political ether to explain systemic racism to us right after Obama. That's all. He's a CRT op because it so just white flex. <laughs> uh, and yeah. who? Well, um, we got. I mean, I'm. To... Yeah, let's so, declassify. Yeah. What's next? I'm thinking it. Yeah. I mean, come on. If you did everything, then obviously we all want to see the alien files, whatever those are. We want to see. Didn't what they come really out at some on... point in pandemic? No, it's always like it's always some naval dude or some fucking air force guy going like, "Oh, bro, oh, bro, look at that. Oh, dude, Whoa, why is it moving like that?" <laughs> Oh, oh, bro. Oh, bro, 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 bro. Like, that's all it is. And you're like, okay, could we have, could we have <laughs> something else? What about Roswell? I don't know. I'm not a fucking alien person. But <laughs> who made Stonehenge? Let's talk about it. I don't want to see this yep. fucking some San Diego fucking, like, Marine being like. Stonehenge left. is in my top five. I want to know Stonehenge. I want to know who killed JFK. And I, yes. I want to know... Uh, Aliens. aliens. I want to. I want to know who runs Honda Governance, and I want to know about aliens. And I want to know what are they spraying? Why are they spraying in the air? That's and not I also want actually fuel. Uh -huh. <laughs> I want. I want my NSA agent to give me career advice. They've been watching. They know where I'm headed. <laughs> they, they're like. <laughs> they're, they're like. Did you hear? She's gonna she's gonna be the host for Staff Judgment. That's I'm Zara. <laughs> uh, all That's right, our gotta, girl. That's our girl. We gotta bring in uh, our guest, our second guest, um, who's gonna <clears throat> inject a little bit of seriousness, no, uh, into this discussion, talking about the election, upcoming midterms. Everyone, I hope you're making a plan to vote and dragging a million people to the polls. Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, former investigative fellow within these times and uh, Leonard C. Goodman Institute, and recently written on Georgia's upcoming elections for the American Prospect. Excellent article. Please welcome Eli Day. What up, though? Hey. Hi. And Detroiter. Uh, Eli yes. put writer and Detroiter in his bio. What does that mean to you to be a Detroiter? Yeah. Uh, firstly, thanks for letting me come through today. Appreciate it. Uh, yeah, I think I, I, I say Detroiter because uh, this is a city that's loved me pretty fiercely um, and uh, is is the the both beginning and middle and end of every story I write. I think I'm always kind of circling themes that I first uh, first encountered here at home, uh, including the stuff on Georgia. You know, I mean, being a Detroiter means that uh, most of us came, you know, from the South, one or two generations removed from being uh, being in states like Georgia, Mississippi, Alabama. Uh, and so writing about the South, uh, where some family still is and where a lot of family came from, has been a really important, um, a really important curiosity for me the last few years. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And and can we can you stay in Michigan and like maybe thoughts on the upcoming election there? I guess. Who we got? I'm like looking at our people in Michigan. It's not really, mm -hmm. I mean, we're more like looking at Wisconsin, right? And like Barnes mm -hmm. versus Johnson, trying to get that motherfucker out. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. But, uh, but the Midwest, mm -hmm. the Midwest, which was so pivotal in, I mean, honestly, in swinging to Trump and then swinging back over to Biden. 
Um, not that we want to just remain in that general election sort of, you know, melee. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, no doubt. Yeah. Wisconsin is definitely a little shinier right now. Um, but states like Wisconsin, Michigan, Minnesota have been under a pretty harsh spotlight the last couple of cycles because of how deeply purple they've become and uh, how they've ricocheted back and forth between the two major parties. Michigan is a I, I don't want to say that Michigan is sleepier this year. There are still very important elections here. Um, the governor, uh, Gretchen Whitmer, is up for reelection and is yes. facing off against uh, um, you know, a, a really nutty right wing candidate in Tudor Dixon. Um, the, I mean, I don't want to prognosticate too much, but it, it does look pretty favorable for, for Whitmer. I think a lot of the more exciting stuff is that uh, Michigan's uh, legislature is pretty ferociously gerrymandered. Mm. Um, we just had a redistricting commission uh, draw up new maps in the last year, which means that there's a greater shot at getting you know, representation in, in Lansing, the state capital, that looks a lot more like the will of actual voters in the state of Michigan. So the stuff down ballot is super important. And there's um, a few that are a real test case for uh, whether or not, you know, progressives can win in competitive, competitive areas in Michigan, some rural parts, uh, which yeah. are now more competitive than they once were. And um, there's some, there's some candidates who I think are putting forth a pretty exciting example of how you could, can campaign in rural, rural corners of Michigan on a genuinely progressive platform uh and, and have a shot so we'll see that's Time will a, tell. i appreciate that breakdown because yes of course tudor dixon uh she's going to be part of our thatcher awards later on for her comments on <laughs> yeah. Gre gretchen whitmer m mocking her for uh for being afraid of being kidnapped or whatever the fuck joke she was trying to make yikes but yeah she's down like 16 points or something like this against whitmer um mm -hmm. but you know trying to play this again the same culture war card she's just like there's pornography in schools mm -hmm. um eli is there pornography in schools in M michigan yeah. <laughs> I, I i put i put some of it there i did yeah, so half of it Zara's. <laughs> i just i left it might be the the problem know. is that like uh uh you know most kids now by the time they are 9 10 11 have already seen they've encountered the internet you know what I mean? So, <laughs> what is this you speak of? Oh, yeah. Nine, ten, my virgin ears. <laughs> You're right, exactly right. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, no, I mean it's anyway. I'm I um I let, let's go on to talk about some of your reporting in Georgia then, yeah. and sort of what you witnessed there. You know, you wrote this article talking about the kind of how Stacey Abrams has been leading this charge of look, if we bring out and build power in mm -hmm. midterms when there's not elections, um, similar to what Black Voters Matter has been doing, mm -hmm. um, especially in communities of color, whether they be, you know, the Black community, Latino communities, Asian Americans. I know like mm -hmm. uh, Georgia has like a growing Asian American uh, voter base. Um, like we're going to win. We're, you know, we'll, 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 we'll flip it and was proven right effectively, even though she lost her own loss, had, you know, her own election stolen from her in 2018, mm -hmm. but in 2020 was proven correct. And now Stacey Abrams, for example, going up once again, what is this third, second, third time against Kemp? Second, uh, yeah. <laughs> second time against yeah. Kemp, that man. dude. Yeah. <laughs> um, so what, yeah, what are, like, what did you hear sort of? from the ground and are do you feel like they've shirked the like democratic machinery um wisdom of appealing to that like white centrist voter uh yeah fair question i, I don't know i don't know that it's ever possible to fully escape um the power and the magnetism of the that type of approach yeah in the, in the party machinery I will say, though, that, you know, for, for my writing, the question that I had, the kind of banner question I had was, can multiracial populism succeed in Georgia? Um, and there are two branches on that banner, if I can mix metaphors that way. But there, on, on the one hand, is, is Stacey Abrams' uh, approach, which she pioneered, which was, you know, starting eight years ago, really in 2014, which was trying to bring attention to the fact that demographics in Georgia were, were evolving and uh, uh, you know, there should be a more supercharged effort to register young people and people of color. 
with a genuinely more progressive uh, uh, vision behind behind that registration drive. Um, and, and and on the other hand, you know that that braided together with Warnock and Ossoff's approach, which was a more genuinely progressive populist argument in the final days of that campaign to, I think, you know, uh, uh, make a really compelling case that uh, um, not only can multiracial progressive populism exist in the South and succeed, it's, it's that it's been there for, for generations. Um, mm. uh, so, you know, on the, on the one hand, I, I wanted to sort of lay out and document, uh, you know, Georgia is a state that has received a lot of spotlight over the last five, six years because a really prominent figure in Stacey Abrams has is a really compelling figure, um, uh, really fantastic, a really fantastic political talent. Um, and underneath that, though, is an entire network and web of activists and dedicated organizers who have been doing their thing there for a really long time. So the American Prospect gave me the chance to go down there and only write about organizers outside of kind of the party apparatus. Um, so I wanted to document some of that. And on the other hand, uh, um, you know, liberals sneer at the South and talk about it as if it can only be a site uh, um, for really vicious repression or, or backwardness. Uh, but progressives have been in the South forever, and, and a lot of them have been Black since the, the days after the Civil War. Um, black Southerners have been making the case for more egalitarian policymaking. And so I also wanted to document some of that, the kind of rich history of progressive populism in the South um, that owes a lot to to the black working class there. Mm. I love the idea of wow. multiracial populism. Um, yes. Um, mm -hmm. And because it it flies in the face of I think what um, honestly even neoliberals even centrists float this bullshit, which is basically like if we tamp down on the people of color identity politics stuff, or if we just don't talk about feminism, we can get these white voters out and populism and let's reach across the aisle and work with racists. And I think you yeah. see that on some, in some actual, you know, some parts yeah. of the left. And you also see that in some parts of, you know, I'm going to say it again, Nancy Pelosi after Clinton lost was also echoing. It's cause she talked about being a woman. It's like, no, it's cause she was a bad candidate. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. like the, please stop with all that. You know? So, so, so I love that because it is a vision. Do you think it can work? You know, we we just had, um, I guess, no. I mean, we had Roy Wood Jr. on who was like, I don't know. I don't see a lot of like energy, you know, coming mm -hmm. out to vote in the midterms. And you also see it's an uphill battle for someone like Warnock. And um, given the wins under Biden have been at least not crystal clear, right? Especially when it comes to voting rights, especially when it comes to any kind of like police or prison reform. Um, it definitely some wins, obviously, in the climate bill, in the American Rescue Plan. But yeah, how is that translating to maybe some of the things you saw and energy? Yeah, I, I would say, I mean, like a lot of places, um, uh, Warnock and, and Abrams, maybe to a lesser degree, are benefiting from, uh, I think, what Nate Silver kind of called the asterisk like quality of this election, which means that it is a year because of a, um, a really devastating event uh, for, for many in the, the repeal of Roe v. Wade. Um, it's one of these midterm elections where the party in power might actually uh, not only hold on to, to their seats, but, but gain a seat or two in the Senate, for example. Um, so, you know, whatever uh, Biden's, uh, uh, you know, deficits, which is several, um, I, I think what, what, what Warnock has been successfully doing is, uh, um, speaking very plainly about just kind of improving quality of life for ordinary people. Um, mm -hmm. You know, he's, he's been a champion of capping the cost of insulin and prescription drugs and, and uh, going after predatory fees, uh, you know, with, with uh, uh, banks and credit cards and stuff like that. Oh, that's so bread and butter. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I think that that's been really to his advantage and also like uh, 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 you know, just, keeping a low enough profile, like he doesn't have the same liabilities that for instance, Clinton had in 2016, when she lost to what was the most infinitely defeatable candidate in presidential political history, right? It, 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 he does not have decades of political baggage um, of, of the right wing machine uh, kind of throwing dirt on his name. He doesn't have that. He also doesn't have like the kind of more alienating qualities that turned a lot of like black and working class people off 
from Clinton. Um, so with a, with a candidate like Herschel Walker, who is compelling in a lot of ways, but also very beatable in Georgia, I think Warnock is, has said, yo, let me sort of lay back in the cut. I'm going to talk my bread and butter. I'm not going to speak much about like the, the Biden administration or anything or tie myself mm. too closely um, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, not coast through, but, um, you know, have a pretty good shot at holding on to that seat. Do you think, I know there's an upcoming uh, debate, I think it's what, October 14th, something like this. Mm -hmm. Again, um, just we just because we had Roy on and he, you know, he's a comic, but he was <laughs> like, I don't know, I think Warnock's got to like, you know, instead of take the high road, just take the low road and start taking pot shots. Yeah. Do you, do you, yeah, what are, what are your thoughts on that? <laughs> or do you feel like, I mean, Warnock defeated um, Leffler, correct? Mm -hmm. And just the most just like a corrupt Barbie doll of a fucking <laughs> corporate shell shill, like just so lifeless and corrupt. I mean, her fucking husband owned the New York Stock Exchange. Like, you know, it's so yeah. obvious. There were there could not be more night and day between the two of those candidates. So rightfully, and with a lot of organizing, but he he defeated her. But Warnock is a little bit different. Do you think his message is is he is he reaching anybody other than like kind of the rich people propping him up? Uh, yes. I also want to know, is Twitter doing a good job of catching it? Right. Yeah. <laughs> is Twitter owning him? Yeah, I think, yeah, Walker, Walker is, is a tougher character to pin down. Um, mm. He is, uh, uh, well, one, I should say that I did, I watched the segment with Roy Wood and uh, I think what, Warnock is is really well liked already. Um, people, mm -hmm. gen I mean, a part and a part of what his what the program has been over there is that, like, listen for a you know for a black Democrat in the South, he's doing pretty well on favorability, um, and and is generally like uh, you know his his ads have all been very wholesome stuff like you know walking Warnock. around with the dog. Yeah, Warnock. And, and, yeah. Oh my God, and, him and the dog. Oh, I love. That. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Just re yeah, really delightful content, and and so I think he's he doesn't have to, you know, he doesn't have to overcompensate for any huge, you know, huge glaring issues in his public profile. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of the stuff from Leffler about him being a radical socialist um, really didn't stick, mm -hmm. and, and, and mm -hmm. I think they're kind of running some of that same playbook right now. But I I think so. I think I think actually. He can stay pretty low key. He should be funny and likable. And still win it. Yeah, he should be funny and likable. I think the um, and you know he should talk his shit and where he can, like he should uh, uh, crack jokes. But without the, you know, there's there's a there's a real there's always a real risk um, uh, for Democrats to come off as uh, you know condescending or belittling um, uh, people for their kind of homespun values, which you know. Uh, 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 Herschel obviously have Herschel Walker obviously has a lot of, um, but so I, right. I you can't, think, you can't mention CTE. You can't mention the yeah. fact that he is often sounds like he doesn't know what he's talking about. You can't, he's straight yeah. up. Like he said, he's like, uh, I'm not as smart, you know? And you're like, yeah, you cannot go any, basically you can't treat Democrats the You can't treat Republicans the way Republicans treat Democrats. It's never allowed. Right. Obviously. There it is. <laughs> um, that yeah. is always a no, no, but yeah, you, but, but Herschel will probably try to appeal on the heart. You know, he cares. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, Warnock being a reverend, like, yeah, I don't know if you can beat that, the heart of a reverend. I mean, it's going to be just interesting. Yeah. He's no, he, he has uh, a quality that is, um, uh, he has a kind of soaring quality with public speaking, um, you know, that comes from years at being at Ebene Ebenezer Baptist Church, which was a pulpit that was previously held by Dr. King. You know, I mean, he um, mm -hmm. he knows the, the lineage that he's a part of and he is definitely capable of of kind of taking off. And uh, uh, but, yeah, the, I think the, the big priority for him is is staying grounded and, and just speaking very plainly where he can and very mm -hmm. directly um, and not. Uh, I, I will say that, you know, I think that what, what everybody could do more of, um, uh, you know, Nate Silver's point about the Asterisk election was that there are these moments in history, you know, immediately after 
uh, um, the Great Depression, and then during the Bay of Pigs uh, in 1998, Clinton's impeachment, and then after the 9/11 attacks, where the the country kind of rally rallies around the the party in power. Yeah. Um, yeah. and so that is that is kind of what's happening with Roe with how voter registration is has been soaring, um, and, and the examples that we've seen in a couple of a couple of early races, um, including the one in Kansas, you know, the referendum on on abortion rights there. Um, right. This is our terrorist attack. It's an inside job from yeah. Republicans. Exactly. Right. This right. Is, this is that post 9-11, <laughs> post and, Roe moment. Yeah, yeah, big time. And and I would say that, you know, so some of the some of what the prognosticators imply right now is that we should be impressed that Democrats are about to hold on to power, which is maybe true. I think it also misses the point that um uh that there is an alternative though to a to a status quo where the best we have to offer is that democrats aren't as shitty as their republican opponents which you could mm -hmm. say is that what everybody could do a better job of in my opinion about these midterms is say um look the status quo is disastrous has been absolutely devastating there is the fact that yes. democracy is under threat in a very shiny way uh, the, the literal ballot box is under threat. There's also all the other ways that democracy and your ability to shape your life is under threat. The increasingly illegitimate Supreme Court, um, the uh, deeply undemocratic United States Senate, um, uh, along with how corporate power has, uh, uh, you know, basically, basically taken over the legislative process in this country and redistributed wealth upward. That stuff is also deeply devastating and disastrous. Um, and uh, uh, I think with with that kind of message, a more direct appeal to people's you know experience, um, you can not only hold on to, to some of these seats, which, which a lot of people are you know I think rightfully shouting out as as something that is uh, uh, unique and rare, but but perhaps could perform a little better in some of these seats where Democrats are um, uh, you know basically relying on the, the fact that they aren't as bad as the alternative. Um, mm -hmm. is, so is, what you're saying is. Well, welcome to Iran. Mm. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> we're just about there. We yeah, if almost... we don't, if we can't hold on. I mean, I feel heartened when I read, you know, your writing on Georgia, and I hear you speak, and especially on that piece of like, again, I'm going to go back to it because it's I just like it, but multiracial populism, mm -hmm. which, you know, I think especially as we saw Bernie Sanders not do very well in the South. <laughs> yeah. You know, we saw the Democratic establishment call out their old favors or their consistent favors. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Clyburn doing his thing. Um, you, there was sort of that idea that like, you know, the progressives have no idea what they're doing in the South. And then that might've been true in, in Bernie's case, you know, he might've actually been a little bit at sea. Who knows? Who knows? You know, I mean, I'm curious about your thoughts, but I'm also curious about, you know, like whether you see the Southern brand of progressivism um, as a little different and why is it different? And, um, and how can we tap into that um, in a way that we haven't before, I guess, I, I don't know. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, no, I think I think that's on point. I, I don't know how different it is. You know, I will say that I think just speaking, speaking plainly about the history of progressivism in the South would be a good start, you know, right. um, knowing the history. Yeah, I, I think I think, uh, you know, shouting out that the, the original populist movement in the late 1800s, um, you know, I think got to start uh, uh, in, in uh, um, no, it got to start in the South. I mean, places like Georgia, places like Alabama. Um, Oklahoma, Kansas, like uh, in particular, um, were the the crucible in which the the original populist movement, which was genuinely a working class multiracial movement, uh, began. is is an important, you know, an, an important historical note that is just not really talked about at all. I um, mean, what splintered the populist movement, to your point about you know of kind of avoiding. Um, earlier about uh, avoiding issues uh, um, of racism and bigotry in these places and just kind of appealing or chasing after some imagined white moderate, um, what yeah. splintered the original populist movement, the original chance of having genuine progressive populism in the South was uh, racism being weaponized as a, uh, as a way to separate uh, working class people. Um, 
Uh, and uh, uh, so the, the biggest, you know, what shot the the tires out on, on populism was racism, where it might have otherwise succeeded in avoiding dealing very directly uh, with with how combustible race can be in these places. If you avoid it, you know, I, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm of the opinion that if you avoid talking about race, your opposition will. Um, and mm. the story that they will give people about race and racism is one where, you know, poor black folks or immigrant folks or people of color or poor people are the reason why we can't have nice things. Um, what you could do instead is say that, like, listen, um, the real, there is a villain. You know, there are people who stand in the way of us having nice shit. Um, and it is yes. multinational, multi-billion dollar corporations. Um, and, and they are trying to distract you with kind of classic divide and conquer stuff so that you'll, you know, you won't, you won't pay attention to how they've been running off with the bag for 40 years. Um, right. And I think people are looking for explanations. You know, I mean, the, the Rand Corporation a couple of years ago put out that report that said, you know, over the last 40 years, uh, 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 the bottom 90 percent of this country has forked over, I think, about 50 trillion dollars to the top one percent in this country uh, through the uh, uh, through the, you know, the tax system and how the tax mm -hmm. system has grown less and less progressive and more and more regressive and in favor of the wealthy. Um, yeah. So if a $50 trillion looting, you know what I mean? I, I think people are right to be pissed off and, and you can point to who the real villains are and build a, a real progressive populist movement based on that that basic egalitarian principle. Right. Yeah. I think that's really well said. And I think that, you know, just two stories that come to mind, you know, even just this week, you got Brett Favre, like, you know, bankrupting, you know, fucking stealing <clears throat> welfare funds in Mississippi. Yeah. Wow. wow. You know. Right. To, to fund his fucking daughter's volleyball court. Meanwhile, right. Jackson still doesn't have clean drinking water. Um, wow. And, you know, and um, I'm uh, blanking on the other story that I was thinking of, but like just oh, oh in Bessemer, just, you know, these close votes. I know that the vote in Bessemer um, when it come when it came to the Amazon vote. Correct. Mm -hmm. it, it didn't go the right. You know, it didn't go the way we wanted, but it was yeah. still a huge story in Alabama, Mississippi. So there there are. I think that's a really important point, remembering um, that progressives in the South have always pushed this country and and moved it. Um, and I think someone like, you know, Reverend William Barber in North Carolina and, and the Poor People's Campaign is definitely picking up on that, obviously, yeah, thread. Yeah, yeah. And that. Anyway, now I'm just talking. But anything <laughs> else, Eli Day, writer and Detroiter, anything else you want to bring up about this election that, that you're that we're missing, you're noticing? Um Final final thoughts. Yeah, no, I, I think I think I would just um, emphasize that uh, you know the South for a really long time has been pro providing a, a blueprint, um, sometimes pretty quietly for how we can uh, um, you know spark real transformations in this country's uh, social and political fabric, economic fabric, um, going back to the to the to the early populist movement. Um, and then running right through the civil rights movement. I mean, if you read, you know, some of Frederick Douglass's stuff um, after the Civil War, he's he's uh, he's talking about what genuine freedom would look like, talking about the the really colossal uh, mistake of of pivoting to an economy based on wage labor would have, um, uh, how you know how it was essentially a second a kind of a kind of second order slavery. For people and so southern southern black progressives have been for a long time sounding the alarm on uh how cruel and unjust our economic institutions are um and then throughout the civil rights movement um laid laid the blueprint uh and partnered with labor and white progressives to uh make this country look a little bit more like it's found in promises um and so i you know i would i would just caution against the some of the sneering about the south um about how impossible change is there um if you talk to black people in the south uh you know i'm a detroiter and when people say say harsh shit about detroit like it's one of those things like you know look me and me and the homies may talk about detroit but can't nobody else talk about detroit you know what i mean right um and, and <laughs> it's your and, mom it's everyone's yeah, exactly. mother like, exactly okay. and, and i hate her south. but you can't talk about anyway. <laughs> right yeah yeah <laughs> and and you go to places like mississippi where i've spent a good amount of time reporting and, and places like georgia and alabama um, people everywhere and black people especially love those places really ferociously. I mean, they have dedicated mm -hmm. themselves to making it more livable. And um, uh, I would say that uh, uh, what everybody should do is just pay closer attention to, to organizations in the South, black voters 
Matter, New Georgia Project, um, the unions down there, Unite Here, at CIU, um, uh, yes. AFL-CIO is doing good stuff there. Like, there's just a lot to pay attention to in terms of progressive organizing there outside of the kind of headline and, and obvious banner figures who are compelling and, and worth paying attention to. Um, uh, but yeah, there's just a, a really tremendous amount of grassroots organizing happening there that p- folks should be looking at and uh, looking to for, for guidance. Love it. Eli Day, uh, follow him on Twitter at Eli, E-L-I-H, Day, D-A-Y. And I, did you write for Convergence recently, my friends over there? Oh, those are your homies? Yeah. 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 So actually, I, yeah, I ha- also have a nine to five life here in Michigan. I work with an organization that does uh, multiracial working class organizing in the state of Michigan. Um, and then I freelance. I freelance when I can. Um, but yes, uh, one of our we got an organizer out in Ben Harbor who I interviewed at um, at Convergence. Um, so there nice. was there was both a piece at Convergence and, um, uh, you know, Ben Harbor is, is going through a, a situation very similar to Front Flint. It's a very black, very poor city, very small in Michigan that's that's enduring a really horrific water crisis. So I interviewed an organizer, one of our organizers there. Um, uh, and we also, though, contributed to a book that was put out by Convergence, I believe, um, a, a book chapter. Power um, concedes nothing, yeah? Yes, sorry. Yeah, we also, me, me and my executive director, R. Reyes, co-authored a chapter on um, uh, Michigan's role in uh, protecting protecting the vote here in Michigan in 2020 and nice. put in, putting out a progressive vision for, you know, a really, a really wide constellation of organizers and organizations here doing incredible work. Um, That's awesome. So yeah, I mean, yeah. so everyone knows Max Elbaum from this show. So uh, he, he helped edit that book. Oh yeah. Uh, he's a, he's a mentor homie. And so, yeah, that book is power concedes nothing. How grassroots organizing wins elections. Folks want to dig in. They should. Um, Eli, Thank you so much for stopping by. Thanks for hanging out and um, yeah. just take good care and please come back. He said yes, yes. even though he's off camera. <laughs> I know in my heart he said yes. Um, Zara, we have one more segment. Will you say? Let's she, do it. Let's do it. Yes. Other other than yes. the bonus, but we have one more. Okay. Let's so of do course, it. We do have award shows on this uh, program, and we did the Cringies last week. This week, we Stop are Stop doing... it. What I win? Oh, it's the Cringies. Oh. <laughs> you and your Honda CRV just uh, <laughs> saying more like Honda CRT, right? Or, I don't know. That that was That's cringe, see? Um, <laughs> so this is the Thatcher Awards. Of course, uh, women who break the glass <laughs> ceiling... <laughs> And use the shards to stab the rest of us in the back. <laughs> All right. First up for your consideration, none other than the Senator Kirsten Cinema, the woman who refuses to wear sleeves in the halls of Senate because she's different. <laughs> okay. The woman who... Keith Olbermann said that he, when he dated her, she was a progressive, which means he fucked it out of her. That's what I think. Um, <laughs> which I've honestly, after, after having to, exactly, yeah. we've heard it about Keith. If you have to sleep with Keith Olbermann, <laughs> I would become a right winger as well. Um, no, but here she is <laughs> praising Mitch McConnell at some event. She's just, just drawing on the similarities between the two of them. Take a look. But despite our apparent differences, Senator McConnell and I have forged a friendship, one that is rooted in our commonalities, including our pragmatic approach to legislating, our respect for the Senate as an institution, our love for our home states, and a dogged determination on behalf of our constituents. Is she sitting on a on a fucking chamber pot? Like, how do you just tell bold face lies like that? She's wearing like, a she's wearing a diaper. She's just like, yeah, I have to. I don't know I what mean, she's I, doing. I have, yeah, I have lied on camera before, but I wore a diaper because you just shit yourself. I mean, you can't get through You're it. So nervous. I I think she's for real. Like, I think she for real. Really? Not only thinks that she, she loves Mitch McConnell. She wants to. How first of all. Um, someone's got to love that gullet. No, when you love money that much and you're in, 
you're in the Senate for that long. You're basically being paid by the same wow. people. She's got, you know, incredible corporate deals and like lobbying firms that what is it the like, I think it's the Retailers Association or someone correct me, someone who's poured tons and tons of money into her, her election campaigns and her coffers. Oh, there you go. Yeah. I mean, this is the woman who, when she, before she voted down the $15 minimum wage on the Senate floor, tapped Mitch McConnell on the shoulder and made sure that he was watching her do her, like, daddy, look, you know? And so there it was. And he didn't even, he would like looked and then he turned over fucking around and then she did her little curtsy and was like, no, no to $15. So she legitimately is a snake. Like she has done a 180 yeah. if she was ever, if she ever had principles to begin with. But yeah, power this is corrupts. Pretty, pretty compelling cringe award here. Does it get worse than this? Oh, it's the Thatcher Awards, and I would ask you to respect oh, the, the difference. My bad. My as bad. In These are different Maggie, women. as in Maggie, <laughs> as in as in strike breaking Maggie Thatcher. Um, don't take away her cunt status. All right, number two. Speaking of <laughs> speaking of raging cunts. Wow, I'm sorry. I All can right. say it. But here is hey, Tudor crampy. Dixon. All right. <laughs> here, here is Tudor Dixon, who um, is just like, if you look up heiress, you know what I mean, in a dictionary, it's like she is the heiress. She just looks like an heiress. She just seemed, apparently her parents were in steel. So there you go. Um, here she is mocking Gretchen Whitmer, current governor of Michigan, um, because of um, the attempts to kidnap Gretchen Whitmer. Remember, uh, dudes, people were oh, sentenced yeah. uh, for that uh, plot to kidnap her because of her mask and vaccine stances and mandates. So uh, here she is on the campaign trail. The sad thing is that Gretchen will tie your hands, put a gun to your head and ask if you're ready to talk. For someone so worried about being kidnapped, Gretchen Whitmer sure is good at taking business hostage and holding it for ransom. <laughs> oh my God! Now, now, Zara, you're a comic, so did you recognize that that was a an attempt uh, at a joke? Yeah, a, a roast, right? I think. Uh... I also remember seeing her in a cult I was a part of. She was trying to brand my labia, and I was scared. <laughs> God. Yikes. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> that, 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 <laughs> Yikes. She, she definitely has, she's got the same Amy Coney Barrett sort of like, again, steely-eyed, um, just sort of reactionary bitch uh, vibe. So I, yeah, I, I yeah. feel that. But her, this is her being like, for someone who doesn't like being tied up and oh put a gun God. to your head, that's exactly what she's going to do to big business. And you're like, what? okay, this is, even if you were to, if you, even if you sold this joke better, even which you really need to do, you <laughs> really got it. That's just a little smile, a little smile. Like I never tell women to smile, a bitch smile. Um, so we know you're attempting a joke. Um, uh, it is just so, so ridiculous. So, so upsetting and, and dumb. And she's, anyway, she I mean, also, she's basically saying I will hold her down for you. She is a terrifying human, but the, she just made a joke about how she would, um, assault a woman to point out how she is a threat to the happiness of big business? Yeah, yeah, yeah. She, okay. She's going to take J.P. Morgan Chase hostage. And they're going to be like... Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> yeah, right? Oh. Um, yeah, no, she. that's what she's going to do to big business. I, I love how she's defending big business. I don't think they need any defense at this point. I anyway, that's our good. number two. Number three. Man, I don't have a picture of her, but let us describe Giorgia Meloni, the potential and most likely prime minister of Italy, um, who has hmm. been part oh. of, just briefly, hmm. represents a party that is so-called far, far right, um, but descended from a hmm. political party that she used to be a part of when she was younger that hmm. was founded in 1946 of followers of Benito Mussolini. 
um, the Italian social movement. Uh, now they're called Fratelli d'Italia or uh, Italian Brotherhood or the Brothers of Italy, whatever. Um, and they're like, we are totally not the same, even though their logos are straight up the same. <laughs> oh, um, no. So she did which a coalition of Republican or right wingers, excuse me, came in to Italy and they there was Berlusconi and his disgusting sort of uh, creep posse. There was some other dude I'm forgetting, some other party I'm forgetting. And then you've got Fratelli d'Italia. So she's most likely going to be the prime minister. Now, she's spoken about immigrants and um, how we need to stop immigration. They do. Yeah. As they do. She mm -hmm. um, has spoken about how the EU is like obsolete, essentially, that she wants Italy to leave it. I don't know if she's going to. She said kind yeah. things about um, Vladimir Putin has been f congratulated what recently. What do you know? Yeah. I mean, all the just check, 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 yeah. check. <laughs> <laughs> just it, this is Steve Bannon's little like Santa Claus wish list here, and uh -huh. he's got it in Georgia Maloney. And here's one of her quotes from a speech that she gave to the World okay. Congress of Families in March 2019. She said, uh, They say it is scandalous. I'm sorry, I'm gonna do my Italian Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, <laughs> Thursday. They say it is scandalous to defend the natural family founded on marriage, to want to increase the birth rate, to want to place the correct value on human life, to support freedom wow. and education, and to say no to gender ideology. The embarrassing Whoa. ones aren't us. The embarrassing ones are those who support practices like a womb for rent. So she's against Whoa. surrogacy. Abortion at nine months, which doesn't exist. And uh -huh. blocking the development of children with drugs at the age of 11. So... Mm. Again, transgender care, gender affirming care. This is it's again check, 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 birth rate check, anti trans wow. check, abortion at nine months check. And she's blonde, Zara. This is no, she, she is us, we are her. This is like we gotta with the Marjorie Taylor Green wishes, you know what I'm saying? Wow. Okay, so who is it going to be? Right wing global movement. Oh, this is hard. Who okay, gets your, who gets your award? We've got cinema. We've got Tudor Dixon. For that name alone, she should probably get an award. Yeah, and yeah. Georgia Meloni. Oh man, this is rough. Okay, <sighs> let's see. The first <laughs> one, I feel like anybody who calls Mitch McConnell a friend is that's <laughs> tough that's tough i mean you're you're hanging with the devil that's yep. really hard and then there's uh you know uh the the woman who is leading fascism in italy again mm -hmm. 80 uh, years later i mean look it was it's the later. birthplace of it so arguably you know she's just going back to her the roots so, okay, how do you usually decide this? Because part of me is like, I feel like it should go to the middle bitch. The, <laughs> the middle one bitch, in the I like that. Dress. What's her name, Tudor? Tudor, Tudor? yeah. Well, yeah. We, can have, we can see what the comments say. Um, but I also feel like she's just like won everything in her life and chosen to be a minion. You know what I mean with it? Like... For With sure. all the privilege that you have in the world, you've decided to be a minion. And she's just like so revolting. But I feel like she's a malignant narcissist that kind of wants that attention. How do you decide this? What do you use as your criteria? Tell me. I mean, I don't know. I think that I'm, I'm, hmm. Usually, Marjorie Green's won this before. I think Kirsten Cinema's won this before. Um, hmm. I think Kirsten, for me, it's more like who's, Who's doing new? Who's doing something new? And ah. I have to give that either to Tudor or Maloney, but Tudor Dixon is going to be, you know, she's going to be on The View in six months uh, no. or on fucking CNN. Yeah, she's going to have, she's going to fail upwards when she loses to Gretchen Whitmer. Um, and so I don't, I don't feel, I don't feel threatened by her. Georgia Maloney. Really? Yeah, Georgia Maloney is also the chair of like basically kind of a right wing caucus in the European Union. I forgot what the name of it is. And she like she converges like, you know, 
Spain's Vox Party and um, Poland's right wing party and like an or Orban's party. Like she's just like she convokes them all. She feels a little bit like, you know, a um, she's she's kind of like the who's not Sauron, but the the Sa Saruman. I forget. I'm not. a Yes. Fuck I think that's the, the one. Yeah. The flesh version of Sauron. She does that. But with the far right. I mean, that's Sauron's obviously that's Steve Bannon's eye. You know, that's right there. It, it looks like his, you know, it's just like his little pock marks on his face. I think you're right. I think it has to go to her because she's also attempting to lead a nation. Yes. And she's attempting Not, to lead a nation. Right. Right. She's that, so I'm, I'm, I'm going with Georgia today. I'm going with Georgia. Let's do it. We've, we've got some agreement. We've got a, People in the chat also, Martin on YouTube, Maloney's number one, Camperman. There we go. Uh, Look at that. We came to it democratically, folks. It's all democratic because I read one comment and they <laughs> agreed with me. Um, <laughs> Zara Norbash, we have a little bit more if you can stick with us on the bonus. Um, but where can yes. people find you and your work? You can find me on Instagram and Twitter at Zara Comedy. You can find me at ZaraComedy.com, Z A H R A Comedy.com. <laughs> and you can find me telling stories on Snap Judgment. Download it, download this, even if you don't Hell listen yeah. to it, just Hell download yeah. it. Get your family to download it. Tell your friends. Yes. I like, I mean, I don't know if I've given a, a big enough plug considering you guys are way bigger than I am, but I love that show. I just, I just love it. And I can't, I'm glad you're right? hosting. I'm glad you're gonna be part of I'm, it. I'm a story producer, not hosting. Oh, damn it! Well, it's you the, know, something might happen to Glenn. You know, he might <laughs> fall ill. Something <laughs> might befall. Glenn. Yeah, the Beats Master. If you're listening, <laughs> Mr. Washington, I'm sorry. No, no, no. That's amazing. I'm so glad you're there on the other end. Then, uh, obviously, finding them good stories. Zara, yes. Be well. Everyone follows our comedy. Make sure you tune in for her dates and anywhere she's going to be live because um, she's wonderful. Uh, and thank you guys for sticking around, for being here. Of course, if you want that bonus, sweet, sweet, sweet bonus content, you know they're on maternity leave. Y'all are going to be first on my mind. I mean, first patrons, small child second, feeding myself third, right? Sleep fourth. Um, but uh, head on over to patreon.com slash bituation room and get at it. A few comments for y'all. Um, why everyone is waiting. Moon Dragon actually commenting on that says, don't leave us. If you got to do a show in the middle of labor, do it. No. See, that's that's for the only friends. I mean, I don't know. That's like some top tier patrons. If the top tier patrons want to see me stream labor, yo, I'll do it. I'll fucking do it for y'all. Um, James Call on YouTube. Thanks for the super chat. First time here. I love it when you interact with Jank and John. You're quick and funny. Who's Jank? Who's John? <laughs> Never heard of. I'm just kidding. Uh, obviously, those are my TYT homies. Thank you so much, James. That's very sweet of you. Um, James Call also. I, I just have. I like this uh, saying. Dark Gustavo. <laughs> speaking about uh, uh, Gustavo Petro. Um, Owen the Schmoopy Dragon. Prius twinsies. I love my Prius. I love my prayers too. Um, uh, Terrence on YouTube says, I'm part Iranian, Russian, and Italian American. It's not a good week. <laughs> Sorry. That's very funny. Um, uh, let's see. Um, Keith Somerville uh, weighing in on the Iran discussion on YouTube. The hijab mandate has little to do with faith in this circumstance. In this circumstance, it's simply another tool of repression applied to half the population by the Iranian theocratic state. I think that's that's what Zara was was effectively saying. Sharpie Diesel, are we covering are we covering chemtrails today? Maybe sharpening guy on Twitch. Are birds real? No, they're not. Um, Pop Tart Dragons on YouTube, Southern Progressive here. We definitely exist. And then Rachel Atwood says, I'm sorry, I'm sad about leaving Ukraine for good this time. I left the country in the first week of the war and only returned this month. There's so much I haven't been exposed to, so I feel reluctant to comment too much on the nitty gritty. Well, Rachel, thank you for at least just telling us what's going on. I mean, it, it is, 
I don't blame you, right? I mean, you've got Putin saying the war is continuing. It's going to escalate. He's going to probably use those bogus referendums um, as pretense. And it is incredibly scary. So um, just sending you lots of love um, and solidarity. And thank you, everyone. Uh, James Call, thank you so much for that. Again, super chat. And with all of it, let's go into... The fart song. Yeah. Thank you to everybody for being you. No. Thank you to the patrons at $10 or more. Barry Drake, welcome. You're so awesome. Thank you for being here. To the big tippers, Stephen Sherlock. I'm so sorry I didn't see that you tip me at Venmo, TBR-Live, TBR-Live on Cash App. Steven has some requests for guests. I will see about booking those. Thank you to the Twitch subs, um, the Jukesters, Clarence Thomas, Hunger Games 1989, Poe the Frickin' Reekin' Dragon, Hippie Spot, Pinga Pinto Grande, KM81677, Elitois Black Dragon, Stars View, Teak Van, Lizzie Nepon, Calm Like a Bomb, Fart of the Meal, Suckle Dragon, Fart of the Meal, mm. You win today's name contest that I just announced. Um, and of course, thanks to producer Paige Omek for always c -c crushing it. To Maximilian Inhoff, to Alexander Orness, and to Andy Vasoyan helping me put this show together. We stream every Tuesday, 1 p.m. Pacific, 4 p.m. Eastern on YouTube and Twitch. We will most likely be back next week, October 4th. Um, but... Then I will be taking a hiatus until most likely the middle of November. Stay tuned. Follow me and the show on all the socials at Bituation Pod on Twitter, um, on you, uh, excuse me, on uh, Instagram and TikTok at Franny Fio. Um, I'll definitely be announcing my return on TikTok, choreographed with a very small child that cannot even like move. And I'll be like, dance, dance. What are you doing? Make mama money. Anyway, um, <laughs> and with that, guys, remember to fight the power and fuck the patriarchy and don't just bitch about it. Be about it. Love y'all. Later.